Thank you very much. I have only just uh, realized how many of these Haven Center lectures are, are inflicted upon you people, and so I give you my tribute for your stamina in coming to lecture after lecture after lecture, including, I'm very gratified to say, to mine. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the costs of inequality, um, meaning income or wealth inequality capitalism and democracy at crossroads. And I have two epigraphs. This first one from Machiavelli, round about 1520, um, when only the powerful propose laws, not for the common liberty, but to augment their own power. The state is corrupted and its foundations are undermined. And then some 400 years later, there's this from Louis Brandeis, which will be well known to you, I'm sure. Um, we must make our choice. We may have a democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. And so these two statements are very closely aligned and they set the theme of what I'm going to talk about. The costs of inequality have very, been ignored for a very long time and I think this is part of the answer. It's another great quote from de Tocqueville. When inequality is the common law of a society, the greatest inequalities do not call attention to themselves. Um, and in fact, economists, and I am myself very interested in economists, the profession of economics. Um, uh, economists have long ignored income inequality. By the way, Y is the standard uh, letter for income and I use IN as an abbreviation for inequality. So when you say C-Y-I-N, that's income inequality. When I say income inequality, I wish also to include wealth inequality. The trouble is that we don't have much data on wealth, but it's really wealth inequality that is the big driver of what I'm talking about. So here's Martin Feldstein, one of the most um, distinguished high-profile uh, professors of economics in the United States, former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, etc., etc., etc. Income inequality is not a problem in need of remedy. Um, Robert Lucas, who won the Nobel Prize, also a professor at Harvard, I uh, love this one. Of all the tendencies that are harmful to sound economics, notice this, sound economics, the most seductive and poisonous is to focus on questions of distribution. And then you have my friend William Boiter, who um, used to be at LSE, but multiplied his salary several times over by <laughs> becoming the chief economist at Citigroup. And he said in the Financial Times in 2007, in response to me, poverty bothers me, inequality does not, I just don't care. And I had dinner with him some time after he said that, and. I said, did you really mean that? And he said, yes, why should I worry what David Beckham earns? And the point is that was the end of his concern about inequality. I just shook my head. Um, and there's a question then, why have economists ignored inequality for so long? And I th think there are a number of reasons. One of them is that economics is basically an ethics-free zone or, or a morality-free zone and the way that it's been able to avoid all questions is to invoke the Pareto Principle. The Pareto Principle um, says simply that if a change makes some people better off without making anybody else worse off, then economists can confidently recommend that change. It is a desirable change. And therefore, the implication is that things like envy are totally irrelevant. Envy or other costs of inequality are totally irrelevant. Economists need not worry their minds about that. Um, the second kind of reason has to do with the sources of efficiency and innovation, the belief that the market is generally um, the best way of, of optimizing efficiency and in innovation. Um, income distribution is just part of the market system on the whole, government intervention in markets has costs greater than the benefits, and therefore um, there's not much of a role for government to try and alter um, market income distribution. And so the upshot is, is a kind of nonchalance amongst economists on the grounds that inequality is simply a byproduct of 
the, of a system which is raising living conditions for all. We all want everybody's living conditions to be raised, and if the cost of that is rising inequality, then too bad. The implication, but it's never said, is that economists needn't ever ask the question of when, when is the inequality too much. It's simply we need inequality, and that's kind of the end of the story. And then the third reason has to do with the use of this very misleading, uh, a very standard use, uh, but very misleading use of the Gini coefficient. Um, the point is that the Gini coefficient directs attention to inequality across the whole distribution from the top to the bottom. And so um, economists are concerned to explain, let's say, um, inequality within the bottom 99%. Um, and so um, if uh, inequality in the bottom 99% is rising because um, of skill bias technological change, because um, college graduates are getting higher incomes than high school graduates, then that's just due to technology. That's just due, due to the natural workings of the market. It's an apolitical process. And um, so if you're focusing just on um, that part of the distribution and ignoring the top, then it's at least remotely plausible to say, well, this is just natural. And that is what economists have done, and they've kind of, they've, their minds have gone to rest at the point of saying that increasing inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient is simply due to rising technological, uh, yes, to rising skill intensity, rewarding people who have the skills and penalizing those who don't. So this is all natural and apolitical. Uh, so these are some reasons, I think, why economists have long neglected inequality. Um, in the case of the World Bank, there are some more um, overtly political considerations, and I, I want to begin by referring to the bank's um, uh, flagship uh, reports. Annually, the bank publishes the World Development Report. Uh, beginning in 1978, um, uh, somebody has done a word count, uh, counting words relating to poverty and counting words relating to income inequality or income distribution and uh, across the whole range from 1978. And the basic conclusion is that um, over that long span of world development reports, the World Bank has said almost nothing about income inequality or even income distribution, while it has said a lot about poverty. So fast forward to 2005, when a group in the bank uh, uh, proposed to the board the, of executive directors of the bank that the next World Development Report, 2006, be on the subject of inequality and development. So this proposal went to the board, and the board said no. Um, and the reason the board gave is this one. Inequality is a political concept. We, the World Bank, are an apolitical organization. We can talk about expanding opportunities, and we can talk about poverty because opportunities and poverty are apolitical. Um, but we cannot talk about reducing inequalities because that's political. So the team went back and redrafted their proposal and said, OK, well, we're not going to talk about inequality, as in inequality of outcomes, income outcomes. We're going to talk about in inequality or improving equality of access. Or They didn't actually use the word access. They used the word opportunities opportunities to earn income. And this went back to the board, and the board said, OK, well, opportunities, that's apolitical. So go ahead, you can write about um, improving access to opportunities, which they call equity, and hence the title of the World Development Report 2006 was Equity and Development. Um, the G20 <coughs> uh, ignores, consistently, strenuously ignores income inequality. I did mention this yesterday, but it's worth mentioning again that the, um, the communique from this summit in St. Petersburg in September 2013, in other words, just a couple of months ago, a 12,000-word uh, communique uh, made no mention of the words income inequality and just one mention of the phrase income distribution. Um, and 
uh, it actually made three mentions of the phrase inclusive growth. And some members of a work group, a work group working to uh, provide a paper to um, the G20 finance ministers and the G20 leaders, um, a work group had proposed that uh, the G20 modify its um, formulation that uh, the G20 was concerned to promote balanced, uh, no, wait a minute, strong, balanced, sustainable gro uh, growth. This working group proposed that they add uh, <laughs> inclusive growth. So strong, balanced, sustainable, inclusive growth. Or they actually, ac what they actually proposed was take out balanced and say strong, sustainable, inclusive growth. And the finance ministers said no. Um, inclusive, that means, um, uh, that means social work. That means uh, kind of uh, worrying about the poor. And that's not for us to worry about. Um, we, we're just concerned with growth. Um, and so when, when the members of this task force saw the communique and they saw that their, fa their favored phrase, inclusive growth, got into somewhere in the text, in the 12,000 words, three times, they felt jubilant. They felt this was a great victory, even though the, um, the formal kind of heading uh, was not allowed to be changed to include the phrase inclusive growth. However, there has been an upsurge of concern about inequality recently. Um, for example, the World Bank has recently issued some reports on income distribution, nationally and internationally. And just one month ago at the annual meetings, the IMF sent shockwaves through the annual meetings because it, at the time of the annual meetings, it published a report called the Fiscal Monitor Taxing Times. You would think this would be a very boring technical document, but some journalists burrowed down into this document and they saw, to their horror, or uh, actually some of them were quite delighted, that there was a phrase buried in the text um, that where the IMF said scope seems to exist in many advanced economies to raise more revenue from the top of the income distribution. And the text went on to say that this would also help to fight growing income inequality. And the reason why this sent shockwaves was because the IMF had never talked about these things before, not even buried deep in the text of some apparently very technical document. And so um, the Financial Times was one of them, uh, one of the papers that made something of a feature of the fact that the IMF, deep in the body of this one paper, had actually recognized that there was a problem of growing income inequality. So this is the state of um, the debate. Um, another example of recent concern comes from the World Economic Forum, the Global uh, Risks 2012 report. The, um, the World Economic Forum got a large number of respondents to their global risk survey um, to score a number of economic, environmental, geopolitical, societal, and technological risks over the next 10 years, to score them by their likelihood and by their impact if the risks actually happened. And it was quite striking. I was surprised um, because the, of the, the top three uh, risks in terms of uh, the combination of likelihood <coughs> and impact. First, chronic fiscal imbalances. Second, severe income disparity. This is the second biggest risk and co-equal with water supply crises. So that's uh, another sign of some growing recognition that there might be a problem to do with inequality. I think one reason for, just one reason for the recent concern is that um, we have recently got data on the top 1% or higher, um, the point being that until recently this data was just not available, it wasn't, um, the, the data was not available from a relatively small number of people in this very top bracket, but um, economists like um, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Seiss have been doing good work in, in ferreting out this information and have begun to publish information on which you can calculate things like the share of the top 1%. And so it becomes quite clear that the standard um, economics explanation 
of why rising inequality, meaning inequality of the whole distribution, is simply due to technological change. The reason why that won't work anymore is because that idea that um, college graduates are getting more than high school graduates because of technological change simply cannot begin to explain why it is that the top 1% are just taking off into the stratosphere um, above the college graduates, for example. Uh, that's an entirely different kind of uh, question. Um, so that question has now, as of quite recently, sort of come onto the horizon. What I want to do now is to run very quickly over trends in the share of the top 1%. This is what I mean by income concentration. When I say income concentration as distinct from income inequality, I'm talking about concentration at the top, particularly the share of the top 1%. I imagine that many of you know this diagram. It shows the share of the top 1% in the US from 1913 to 2006. So you see the very steep run up to 1929 when the share of the top 1% reached roughly 23 to 22-23%. Share of the top 1% was 22% of national income. <coughs> then the Great Crash, the Depression, Second World War, uh, the great society, and so on and so on, down to um, a low, terrible squeeze on the top 1%. They were getting, by the end of the 70s, only 9% of national income. Then in came Reagan and Thatcher, and um, the share of the top 1% took off like a July the 4th skyrocket to reach by 2006, more or less the same as it had reached in 1929. And... Um, just as the, uh, this run-up in the share of the top 1% um, during the 1920s was germane to the following Great Depression, so this run-up um, through this period was germane to the current crash the, the, and the long slump that we are living through. Um, here are some really shocking statistics. They relate not to the share in national income of the top 1%, but the share of the top 1% in the increase and the increase in national income in a certain period of time. So during the Clinton years, the top 1% got 45% of the increase in national income. During the Bush years, 65%. And I was just shocked, blown away by this figure. During the Obama years, 2009 to 12, 95%. These are figures from Piketty and Seiss. Um, and you just wonder how this could possibly be in a apparently stable democracy rather than, let's say, a military dictatorship or Latin American banana republic or something like that. Um, and just to show how much more unequal the U.S. is than uh, comparative countries, this is not a particularly good measure of inequality, but it's the remuneration of CEOs to the medium annual wage. In the U.S., the Fortune 500 companies, the 500 companies, the average of the remuneration of the CEO to the median is over 300. In Britain, roughly equivalent, it's about, let's say, under 200. And in Germany, the poor German executives, the poor German CEOs are only getting 90 times the median. Um, it's strange, they don't uh, all resign uh, and play golf. Or, and they don't all go off to the United States where they can uh, multiply their salary many times over. Um, this pattern is quite common in the Anglo countries. And here's um, a case from New Zealand, a country from which I originally came. Um, I'm not going to go over this in any detail, but this is from 1984, which was the year of the great liberalization, the great Big Bang liberalization. New Zealand carried out the biggest liberalization, most comprehensive liberalization, the most sustained liberalization of any advanced capitalist country. Um, and many people expected New Zealand would soar ahead of Australia and Canada and the other lagging Anglo countries as a result of this. The truth was exactly the opposite. New Zealand sank. But the top 1% in New Zealand did extremely well. So this is the median from 1984 to 2012, the median, this is in dollars, New Zealand dollars. And you can see the median is completely flat. Uh, this is the top 1%. Uh, 
to the top 1% just did terrifically well. It was bliss to be alive in New Zealand through this period, for if you're in the top 1%. Um, this is the share of the top 1%. This is the percentage, the share of the top 1% in national income. This is the start of the Big Bang liberalization. And this was the fastest increase in the world at that time, in the share of the top 1%, from the mid-80s to the mid-90s. Again, bliss to be alive. Um, this is Iceland. Um, th this actually is the US. Uh, it's more or less the line I showed before, the share of the top 1% in the US, uh, beginning, this is 1980, here, 1980. Um, and this is Iceland, the share of the top 1% in Iceland, beginning in about 1995, which was when Iceland began its Big Bang liberalization. And you can see that the share of the top 1% in Iceland also shot up like a July the 4th skyrocket before crashing in 2008, back to about 8.5%. So the poor Icelandic elite now is, the top 1% is getting only 8.5% of national income as compared with 20% um, in, in the years just before 2008. It's a terrible, terrible loss for the top 1%. Um, here's another example. This is in Icelandic currency. So this is dollars, not percentages. And this is the median, and this is the top 1%. Um, but in Northwest Europe, this didn't happen to anything like the same extent. This is the share of the top 1% in Scandinavia over all this period, but this is the relevant part. This is 1980 here. This is 5%. And you can see that from 1980 onwards, instead of going up like this, the line remained more or less constant, except something happened in Norway. I've never managed to find out what happened in Norway to lift the Norwegians up above the, Scandinav the uh, Swedish and Danish. But I mean, basically speaking, you get the same kind of line in Germany, the same kind of line in France. You don't get a big increase like this, which shows that you can run uh, and if a prosperous capitalist economy uh, without having the kind of run-up in income inequality at the top um, in the, that you see in the Anglo countries. Um, again, just finally in this picture of inequality distributions, um, in the uh, original OECD 15 countries in the mid-80s, you take those countries, then um, by 2000 and 9, 10, inequality measured by the Gini coefficient now increased in all of them, all of the 15 uh, uh, except one, which was Greece, because Greece had the terrible collapse. But, um, and then in terms of the um, present day uh, distribution of inequality measured by the Gini across regions uh, of the OECD, the 30 OEC, 33 OECD countries today, then the most unequal countries in the OECD are the Latinos and the Middle East. The Middle East here means Israel, basically. Then the second most unequal, the Anglos. The third most unequal, the European Mediterraneans. The fourth, the Northwest Europeans. And then down at the bottom, most equal, <coughs> the Eastern Central Europeans coming out of a legacy of um, communism. So the conclusion then is clear that during this period from 1980 onwards, especially in the Anglo countries, the very rich have soared ahead of the rest of the population. So that's the first part of the talk. The second part is now going to be about um, the costs of higher levels of income inequality. Um, one type of cost, economic costs, I'm not going to talk about that. We could spend not just one, but several lectures talking about the economic costs. For example, the relationship between um, rising income inequality and financial crisis. I do recommend this film. The film is called The Floor, uh, directed by David Sinkton. It's a fascinating documentary um, which was shown at the Sundance Film Festival. I've shown it to several cohorts of my students and they have been absolutely gripped by it because it's not just informative, it's also very well done. It's very funny. Uh, uh, in addition to informative. Um, Floor comes from Alan Greenspan's testimony to, con to Congress in late 2008 that he had discovered a flaw in his ideology 
the ideology being that the shareholders of a bank would always take care to ensure the bank didn't take imprudent risks. And lo and behold, he, he discovered this flaw. Uh, I think he subsequently retracted that admission. Um, then the second category is um, social and health costs of inequality. Um, and this book by Wilkinson and Pickett, The Spirit Level, I'm sure some of you know about that. It's sold uh, over 200,000 copies. It's been translated into 25 languages. And it's basically showing the uh, connection between higher and lower levels of inequality measured mostly by the Gini coefficient and various kind of indicators of social and health problems. I'll just show one kind of connection. This is, uh, I was really startled by this chart. It shows average male heights in centimeters. So these are centimeters. This is 180 centimeters. Average male heights. And this is the Gini coefficient of different countries. So you can see um, that the countries with the highest levels of inequality by the Gini have the lowest male heights. The countries with the lowest Gini coefficient have the highest male heights. And this correlation is much stronger than with per capita income, for example. And so this is one rather striking illustration of the, um, the, the sort of bulldozer force of inequality shaping all kinds of features of societies. Um, and um, the final point I'll make, uh, just under this general heading of, of um, social and health costs, um, is that there is an inverse correlation, a quite a strong inverse correlation between inequality and the rate of intergenerational social mobility. So that the bottom line is that the, the greater, and the mechanism is that the greater the gains from being in the elite, then the more the elite will fight to ensure that their children stay in the elite. In other words, the more the elite will fight to put a glass floor under their own children. And so you get this inverse uh, correlation. And it's, I think, very ironical that of the major OECD uh, economies, the, the two with the lowest rates of intergenerational mobility are the ones that most advertise themselves as the land of opportunity and open markets, commitment to free markets, namely Britain and the US. They have the lowest uh, rates of intergenerational social mobility. What I want to mainly focus on now is um, the political cost, because I've been struck at how little research seems to have been directed at this question of the political costs of income and wealth inequality. Um, and I think the reason, uh, at least a large part of the reason, why political scientists have rather ignored this, just like economists have ignored it, is because whereas the economists are committed to this model of the free market, uh, political scientists are equally committed to the median voter model. Um, there's a strong kind of resonance between these two archetypal models, the free market neoclassical or neoliberal model for economists and the median voter model for political scientists. The median voter model says that governments are most responsive to the preferences of the median voter, and therefore rising inequality does not skew public policy towards the preferences of the wealthy. So we don't really need to worry about um, income inequality. And I'll say, uh, I'll, I'll come uh, later to a quite remarkable statement made by my friend and colleague at LSE, who's the head of the government department, when I asked him what research has been done in Britain on the relationship between inequality and public policy. Wait for it. Um, so, I'm going to talk about two co kind of costs of political, uh, of um, uh, income inequality, political costs of income inequality. The first is um, political polarization or paralysis. And this book, uh, Polarized America by McCarthy, Poole, and Rosenthal, comes out with a truly astonishing finding, a finding of a correlation which is very unusually high uh, across a long period of time, unusually high in, for social science. And it's this. Um, so I'll just explain it. This, if you can see, is a blue line. And it's basically the share of the top 1%. Where does it go? 
share of the top 1% in, uh, of, of, in national income. So this is basically the same line as you saw before. The share of the top 1% in national income is this line. And this other line, the red line, is an index of political polarization where they measure polarization in terms of votes between Republicans and Democrats in the House of Representatives. Um, I won't go into the details of how they construct this index, but the point is the correlation coefficient is 0.73, and if you take just the sort of post-war years, it's even higher than 0.73. Just what the mechanism is relating rising income concentration to increasing political polarization, as in inability to make decisions in the House of Representatives. What that mechanism is, I don't know, but it is a really striking correlation. Um, now, the second kind of cost, uh, the political cost of income inequality, um, has been called <laughs> representational bias. That is, representational bias in favor of the wealthy. And one person who has done a lot of research of this kind is Martin Gillens, um, who published a paper in 2005. He's recently published a book on the same question um, called, I think, um, Affluence and Influence. Um, and this is uh, one of his main conclusions. When Americans with different income levels, so think of top, middle, and low income levels, differ in their policy preferences, actual policy outcomes strongly reflect the preferences of the most affluent, and this is the killer, but bear virtually no relationship to the preferences of poor or middle class, think of the median voter model, or middle class Americans. That was one conclusion. And then he goes on to draw a broader conclusion. The vast discrepancy in government responsiveness to citizens with different income levels stands in sharp contrast to the ideal of political equality that Americans hold dear. Representational biases of this magnitude call into question the very democratic character of our society. Um, and a recent paper by Benjamin Page and Larry Bartels and Jason Seabright, Seawright um, uh, go into this in more detail. And I'll just, just to flesh out this point, about the differences in preferences between the wealthy and the general public. I'll show some examples which come from this paper. Um, respondents were asked, the legal minimum wage should be high enough to prevent full-time workers from being in poverty. So s almost 80% of the general public agree, half of the wealthy agree, 40% of the wealthy agree with that statement. That's an example of the differences, of the preferences between the wealthy and the rest of the population. Here's another example. The federal government should provide jobs for everyone able and willing to work who cannot find a job in private employment. 53% of the general public agree, 8% of the wealthy agree. Um, and here are some other issues on which there's quite a big difference, a difference on the minimum wage, difference on the taxation, capital gains, um, difference on what should be the top economic priority today, um, uh, whether to cut the budget deficit or to reduce um, unemployment. Um, uh, and then the question is how to cut the budget deficit by cutting social spending or by raising taxes. On these issues, there's a big difference between the preferences of the wealthy and the general public. Um, the wealthy oppose health insurance, oppose more spending on public schools, and certain kinds of regulation of banks. So this is the, the bottom line conclusion on this, from this work on representational bias. As income concentration increases, the rich make it harder for the non-rich to have a voice in how society is run. So that raises the question, what is it that shapes the preferences of the wealthy? Why do the preferences of the wealthy differ as much as they do? And um, one answer comes from uh, research by um, a number of social psychologists, and this conclusion, their conclusion goes under the name of the money-empathy gap. Um, uh, and the, the basic conclusion is that people living high 
on the socioeconomic ladder, where money is the primary marker of status, tend to become, to be, or become less empathetic, more selfish. They tend to see other people as aids or as obstacles to their own ambitions. Um, and they certainly uh, have rather little empathy with people who are substantially below them on the ladder. They tend to believe that their own success is due to their own merits, not by accidents of the stock market or anything, I mean by good for rising stock markets or anything like that, and that the poverty of others is due to the personal failures of other people. That's what the money empathy gap means. If you want to follow this up, type in Paul Pitt, uh, in the psychology department at Berkeley, type it in to Google and you'll come up with some references. Here's an example of the money empathy gap from Paul Ryan, who needs no introduction. We don't want to turn the safety net into a hammock, I love this word, hammock, that lulls able-bodied people to lives of dependency and complacency. And here's the same thing from the New Zealand Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister. Anyone on a benefit, uh, on a welfare benefit, actually has a lifestyle choice. If one budgets properly, one can pay one's bills. There's no need for any increase in welfare payments. Um, and then, the, uh, just to underline the point, that it's the preferences of the wealthy that gets trans get translated to public policy. Here's an example. The national minimum wage fell in real terms by one-third in the period from 1975 to 2011. And as you will know, just last, uh, last October, last month, 47 million Americans had their food stamps benefits cut. All this is pointing to the proposition that uh, economic policy in the United States, but in the Anglo countries, um, in the Latino countries, um, is made by the top 1% for the top 1%. Now I come to the question I put to my friend and colleague, the head of the government department at LSE, I asked him what sort of research on representational bias there has been in Britain and, for that matter, in Europe. And to my amazement, this was his reply. That's a good question. Sounds like something I should work on. Thanks for the idea. And I've actually asked several people, not just him, what's the research? And people say, it, people just come up with a blank. It's as though they hadn't even thought of the idea, and I keep wondering, uh, I'm not really a political science scientist. I don't really. I'm not in that community. I keep wondering what on earth they're doing. If they're not doing this, what are they doing? It's such. It's so obvious. But here is a piece of empirical uh, evidence that is relevant. Um, it's a study of 18 OECD countries since 1960, and base, the bottom line is that countries that have had the largest increases in the shares of income in the top one percent have also seen the largest cuts in top-rate uh, taxes, which is exactly what the top 1% would want, of course. So that's, that suggests a pretty strong translation of the preferences of the wealthy into public policy. But um, the trouble with treating things as I've been treating them, that is kind of looking for cause and effect, cause and effect, is that it, 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 it obscures the bigger picture. And the bigger picture of what's happening, especially in the Anglo countries, is what I call the superversion, not subversion. Subversion is undermining from below. Superversion is undermining from above. And what we are seeing is superversion of the state um, in which the very wealthy are attempting to destroy basic functions of the state, especially welfare functions of the state. And they're doing so on behalf of a wealthy class, like the top 1% or something of that kind, which has an effect seceded from the national society, um, floating free, like in a hot air balloon, so to speak, um, looking down um, uh, and, and certainly avoiding uh, taxes, putting their, their wealth into tax havens and the like, or um, putting their wealth into property in London. London property now um, has become a kind of a new international reserve currency. There are whole stretches of the wealthy parts of London 
where if you go to them at night, it's all dark. There are no lights because the property is all owned by foreigners. Three quarters of the new residential uh, housing in London has been bought by foreigners. Uh, they're simply buying it as a reserve currency. Um, and, and so they have no role in the society. They're not paying taxes or anything like that. But they, they, um, they just kind of float, come in from time to time. Um, and they're, they're very keen on giving money to the Conservative Party for boosting the agenda of privatizing um, public services. Um, what the wealthy do remain loyal to is pageantry, the pageantry of the nation, to military parades, to the flag and the like, but not to the state. This all raises a question which I find fascinating. I don't have a good answer, and I think that Eric may have an interesting contribution to make to this question. I think it's a really important question. Namely, why, given that, as I said, uh, in 2009, 2012, 95% of the increase in US national income went to the top 1%. Why, in, um, in, in the presence of all this income concentration, um, have the middle classes remained so apathetic? That is, why has there been not more protest? Why aren't they enraged, angry? Um, uh, and part of the answers from Gary Runciman's work on relative deprivation, that most people's lives are governed more by resentment of narrow inequalities, that is, inequalities of people very close to them, than they are worried about inequalities between them and people far away from them. That may be part of the answer. But I think another part is that the middle classes are fearful of the loss of middle class status. They're more anxious looking down than they are looking up at the way that the rich are taking off. They're more worried that talk about redistribution may mean that people below them are going to be brought up, given handouts, which help them the people down below, but don't help the middle classes. And so they're not about to mobilize in favor of redistribution. Maybe that's part of it, but I have to say, I haven't seen any literature on this question. I think it's a really important one. Now the final part of the talk. I want to come to the um, question of what social democrats, what the center left, let's say, should be doing. I normally don't speak about this but um, I'm making an exception in the uh, circumstances of Madison, Wisconsin, where I think these things are legitimate to be talked about. And I begin with the point that in previous bouts of hard times, the left gained electorally, gained in favor of pushing for, gained uh, to push for more social insurance and the like. But not this time. The center-right continues to win, even through this terrible grinding six-year-long slump. And part of the proximate reason is that the mainstream left has simply lost its political narrative. Um, it doesn't have much to say um, by way of any significant alternative. And then, uh, on the other hand, voters that are angry at unemployment and at spending cuts, they're going off to the extreme left or the extreme right, not to the mainstream left as in the face of the British Labour Party at the moment. It's not making big electoral gains. So what do I think should be done? Um, well, the first thing that the left needs to do is to focus much more on income concentration than it has been willing to do. The left basically, ever since Thatcher came to power in Britain, the, left, the British left made a tactical choice, um, at least it's partly tactical, not to talk about income inequality because they thought the electorate wasn't responsive to talk about income inequality. I think that time is over. The left has to focus much more, not just on inequality, but on income concentration. Um, and to emphasize that whatever may be the, uh, the, dri the technological change driver of income, distribution, income inequality over the whole distribution, Whatever that mechanism may be, or maybe you can bring in the effects of international trade and so on, widening inequality over the whole distribution, or let's say the bottom 99%, whatever that, the uh, concentration that we've seen 
of income right up at the top is not driven by those things. That the concentration at the top is being driven by politics and by policies, which have been, in a sense, designed to do exactly that. And so the left has to highlight much more than it has how a wide range of institutions, rules, policies favor the people who are already affluent. And a key source for this kind of analysis is Dean Baker's work, the recent book, bad title, The End of Loser Liberalism. What does that mean? This is a better title, The Conservative Nanny State. But the two books cover much the same ground. Um, and basically, the, the central message of these books is that many institutions and policies which are presented to the electorate as good for efficiency, good for economic growth, improving living standards for all, in fact, are good mainly for channeling income and influence up to the top of the distribution. And there are any number of examples of how markets have been rigged, markets and policies have been rigged to a channel income right up to the top. One would be the Fed's priority to anti-inflation credibility. Um, this is a mantra of the Fed, but it has very high costs in terms of long-term unemployment. It's a point that um, Paul Krugman keeps making again and again and again in the pages of the New York Times. I do admire him for his persistence and his ability to repeat that message in endlessly uh, different ways. Um, uh, secondly, strong intellectual property laws. They give, they're justified as providing incentives for innovation, but they give government guaranteed profits to pharmaceutical software and other kinds of companies. And it's by no means clear that the um, patent uh, laws, the patent regulations are necessary to get the innovation, but it's clear that they do have the effect of channeling income up to the top. A strong dollar, a strong dollar benefits finance, it hurts manufacturing. Weak financial regulation benefits finance. Corporate governance law benefits CEOs. You have corporate governance laws that say CEOs appoint the directors of companies and that directors of companies set the salary of CEOs. There are no prizes for guessing what happens to the salaries of CEOs. Trade union laws uh, like um, bans on secondary boycotts, they benefit employers. And there are any number of other things, um, other areas that one can look at to show this channeling of income effect. So the first thing then is to focus much more on income concentration than the left has been willing to do so far. Secondly, focus on the costs of inequality. Um, and the, all the kinds of costs, economic, social, health, and political. And so the line of attack on conservatives should be for pursuing an agenda of, of advancing the interests of the wealthy, not for practicing free market policies, not for practicing free market policies, because in fact the, the, the conservatives don't practice free market policies when free market policies would disadvantage the wealthy. Um, and this kind of line of criticizing conservatives for advancing the interests of the wealthy should be electorally favorable to the left, given that most people are on stagnant um, incomes, as income inequality has soared. Um, another thing under the same heading, cost of inequality, don't talk about the um, improving the equality of opportunities, but talk explicitly about improving outcomes, income outcomes. Don't pretend that by simply by improving opportunities, that is a sufficient uh, means a sufficient way of addressing the problem of inequality and of course emphasize the link between inequality today and social mobility tomorrow. Um, and the third main point, the left should avoid being characterized as pro-state. Um, the standard conservative framing of the political debate is we are anti-government, we are pro-free market, you the left want ever larger government in order to protect the interests of the disadvantaged. So that easily translates into we are pro-freedom, you are anti-freedom. Um, and that's electorally very difficult to sell that kind of message. And so as I said before, what the left should be emphasizing is that conservatives are not pro-freedom when freedom would 
harm the interests of the wealthy. The, the, well, the conservatives are in favor of protection for the interests of the wealthy. And fourthly, this vogue word, vogue-ish word, that is coming into fluency now, um, pre-distribution, it's an ugly word, but it's useful. Um, and what this means is that the left should be shifting attention from changes in tax and spend policies, that's redistribution, to changes in market income distribution. Um, I went to a panel at LSE um, a few years ago on the future of the left in Britain. There were five panelists and they talked <coughs> for an hour and a half or so. And in the one and a half hours these five panelists talked, virtually nobody talked about anything other than this set of redistribution issues. That is, all the talk was about how to reconfigure the tax system, how to re reconfigure the welfare system, and so on, as though the private sector over here was functioning just fine. The left didn't have anything to say about that. And this is precisely the omission that I'm directing attention to by talking about pre-distribution. The question is, in particular, why? And there are two reasons why attention should be shifted. One is that the most important determinant of post-tax and spending income distribution is market income distribution before tax. In other words, welfare states are not all that powerful. No welfare state is all that powerful in being able to greatly modify market income distribution, certainly not the Anglo welfare states. So if you want to do something about post-tax and spend income distribution, you have to do something about market income distribution. And the second way, I've all, the second reason for focusing on pre-distribution, I've already alluded to it, is that um, the focus on taxing, uh, taking income away from the rich and then giving it to the poor, that is politically <coughs> difficult to sell because it l lends itself to the conservative characterization which is that they, the Social Democrats or the left, want to penalize winners and reward the losers. We, on the right, champion hard work and innovation. That's a message that go is much easier to, to sell to um, a, a worried electorate than the message, than, than the other kind of, of message. So um, that's the second reason, a political tactic, why the left should be focusing more on pre-distribution than on redistribution. Fifth main point, I'm almost at the end, is that the left has to present big finance as a problem, not as a solution, but as a problem. Economists tend to say that finance simply lubricates the economy. Um, finance is like the oil in the engine, and indeed, macroeconomic textbooks, such as Mike Wickens' textbook, on macroeconomic models, 2008, um, a whole textbook, big fat textbook, has nothing about the financial sector. Um, the OECD macroeconomic model, nothing about the financial sector. The IMF uh, macroeconomic model of the world economy, no financial sector. It's truly astonishing the way that macroeconomics has just kind of airbrushed out the financial sector, and that's why economists didn't uh, anticipate the crash that we're living through. Um, and the reason is because they see money as simply, or finance, simply lubricating like oil in the engine, <coughs> not driving the engine. Um, well, but it, and it's simply not true. The financial sector lends mainly to the financial sector and to the property sector, and much less does it lend for the production of goods and services for making value added. In the case of the UK, for example, uh, British banks have been lending four times as much, four times as much to property and financial markets as they have been lending to non-financial businesses, four times as much, and much the same kind of ratio is found in the US, Canada, Australia, Holland, Sweden, and in other places. So um, I find it completely amazing and, and uh, uh, Incredible that Mark Carney, the sort of pop star um, governor of the Bank of England brought in from the, gov uh, the Bank of Canada, uh, said just a couple of weeks ago that um, finance was Britain's great comparative advantage and that while at the moment the ratio of bank assets to British GDP was four times, 
he anticipated that in another 20 years it could go to nine times. Nine times. And I thought that this was just delusional if you think that you can run a, an economy, a modern economy, with a ratio of bank assets to GDP of anything close to nine times. Uh, in the case of Iceland in 2008, that ratio went to almost ten times. And then Iceland had the biggest fall in GDP of all the OECD countries. The country of the 33 OECD countries, the one with the biggest fall was Iceland. So it is just crazy for Mark Carney to say that Britain can um, and should indeed should aim at uh, even growing the banking sector much more than it is. And he can get away with that kind of stuff because there's been so little kind of um, argument in Britain, especially coming from the left, from the Labour Party and other such places, that presents big finance as a problem. The Labour Party is more or less bought into the idea that the city of London is the future of Britain. Um, and yes, here's, here's another absolutely astonishing thing. I could not believe my eyes when I read this. This is Robert Rubin, quoted in David Roscoff's book, Power, Inc. And David, uh, um, yeah, uh, David Roscoff asked Rubin whether he thought that too big to fail, banks too big to fail, was a problem in the US financial system. And this was Robert Rubin's answer. No, don't you see? Too big to fail isn't a problem with the system. Too big to fail is the system. Um, meaning, he went on to say, you can't be a competitive financial institution serving global corporations of scale without having a certain scale yourself. The bigger multinationals get, the bigger financial institutions will have to get. And so Robert Rubin was saying implicitly that you just have to accept that the banks will be too big to fail and um, if you have a whole set of banks that are too big to fail, you're almost guaranteed to have financial crises, bubbles followed by crashes, because the banks will tend to be run in a reckless way, knowing that the uh, bank will be bailed out and that the uh, senior executives will not be penalized, um, as has been the case now. So uh, basically, Rubin was saying, that we need socialism for the big banks and capitalism for uh, the rest of the population. And then the final point in this social democratic agenda is political finance reform. Everything I've said is more or less sort of written on the sand um, unless um, this issue of political finance reform is dealt with because political parties, including the British Labour Party, depend so heavily on big donors for uh, campaign uh, financing. Um, the trouble is that this is the third rail. This is what nobody wants to touch. And the case in point is the UK Commission on Standards and Public Life, which published a report in November 2011 called Political Party Finance, Ending the Big Donor Culture. And this was a very uh, thick, impressively detailed report, um, which was launched with great fanfare at Westminster with ministers in attendance and the press and so on and so on, all kinds of glamour. And the report died on the evening that it was launched. Nothing more was heard of it to a collective sigh of relief from the leaders of all the political parties. They don't want to touch this issue and therefore the issue is not going to be touched until there's a strong citizen mobilization in favor of um, political finance reform. And of course, in this country, it's all the more uh, urgent because of Citizens United, this, this piece of legislation that would both delight and appall George Orwell. He would regard it as a wonderful confirmation of his worst fears. Um, so that basically is... Um, uh, the end of my talk, we can um, now take some questions and comments if you like, but I just before I end, on this whole issue of a social democratic agenda, you know well the work of uh, Eric and Real Utopias, and in the same broad category, I recommend a book by Andrew Sims, S-I-M-S, -S, and the book is called Cancel the Apocalypse, Cancel the Apocalypse. 
because Andrew Sims is writing from a left-wing perspective, and what he does in this book is to gather together real-world cases of progressive policies and institutions from all around the world, and he sort of puts them together in an, in an imaginary country where all these things are brought together in a progressive country. And it's interesting to read, to see um, the sort of concretization of what would otherwise be quite abstract ideas. So I recommend Andrew Sims, Cancel the Apocalypse, and just uh, two other books I will mention. Um, as I said, I have a strong interest in economics and in the ethics of economists um, and why economics is, has been an ethics-free zone. Um, a, a sociologist at Berkeley named Marion um, Foucard, yes, has written a book called Economists and Societies, and it's about the professionalization of economics uh, in the US, Britain, and France up to the 1990s. Um, and finally, I will recommend this book by um, Angus Deaton at Princeton called The Great Escape. Um, and uh, this is a, a beautifully written book, apart from anything else, and it makes very accessible, otherwise quite technical things to do, for example, with, let's say, purchasing power parity uh, exchange rates versus market exchange rates. Um, it, it makes quite clear how GDP is calculated and what are the problems with the way um, GDP is, is calculated. It's got a lot of information in it about health. He tends to use health indicators more than income indicators of progress. It's called The Great Escape. The subtitle is Health, Wealth, and the Origins of Inequality. Okay, so um, I think we have a little bit of time. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Until, Until 5.30. 5 30. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes? Matt, aren't you sort of, you know, asking the river to flow upwards, sort of going against the natural law of power and suggesting these things that the left should do that the people in power, the rich, are never going to allow to happen? In other words, isn't I come away from this as a determinist thinking, you know, that, you know, the, uh, the powerful have captured, called regulatory capture theory, have captured government. So the left, in using government to essentially take something away from the rich, is almost beyond futile. So, I mean, it just seems like I, I think of you know how could you know how can anything? Aren't you sort of asking the impossible? In other words? I don't see a way out of that feedback loop. Well, I agree that there, there is a very strong um, feedback loop kind of locking in the present structure of inequality. But um, there are things that um, groups, people, individuals on, on the left can do uh, by way, uh, even if in a rather preliminary way, I mean, you have to think of this as a, something that's going to happen over decades, um, by way of reframing um, issues. Um, academics on the left can, for example, talk much more than they have do research much more than they have on things like the costs of inequality. As I suggested, this question of the political costs of inequality has been amazingly under-researched um, to the point where Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page's work really created something of a sensation. Um, so, um, I mean, at least um, that is a kind of direction of going in, in these, in these steps that I've taken. Um, in terms of what academics can do, uh, as academics, that's about all they can do. They can talk about um, the, uh, how to get, um, they can analyze, do research on cases of political finance reform, where there has actually been political finance reform, what effects it has had. They can talk about big finance as a problem that is not accepting the standard line that, you know, finance lubricates the economy, so basically all is well. Um, they can talk much more about pre-distribution than they have, and not focus so much on redistribution. All these are small steps at the level of um, ch changing norms, changing uh, understandings, but 
There is, I don't see any sort of magic bullet. Eric, would you like to come yeah, in on so this? On this point, if the elite was completely monolithic and solidaristic and had a unified vision, then the degree of pessimism that was just spoken is probably justified. But it isn't. Uh, there's not, it's true that, um, for, that 60 percent of your wealthy said they didn't want taxes or whatever was that, but 40 percent agreed with most people. Uh -huh. uh, there, in fact, uh, Warren Buffett wants to have higher taxes and more public goods. We're facing an ecological crisis in which public goods are going to be forced on the society. It's impossible to deal, mm -hmm. quite apart from whether you're going to reduce global warming, just, just dealing with it is going to require massive public spending on public goods. Mm -hmm. uh, the seawall around Manhattan is going to cost tens of billions of dollars to do, and it's not going to be produced by the market. So mm -hmm. there's more than one possible political equilibrium, so to speak, in which segments of the wealthy can be part of reformist change, just like they were in social democracy. Social democracy was not the victory of a unified working class against a unified mm -hmm. capitalist class. It involved significant segments of the capitalist class seeing it in their interest to force the kind of class compromise that social democracy cemented in, in Northern Europe. And that's really, I think, part of the, the top-down aspect of change. Not, um, there's also the bottom-up aspect, building alternatives where you can, but the top down, your list is mostly things that the state does. Yeah. And that part has to enlist segments of dominant classes and elites of various sorts. If they are completely unified, then you're right. There's, I mean, then the, you know, the criticism is right. There's no possibility of having a top, a top down component of a transformative project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I did indicate you. <laughs> so I was uh, somewhat surprised in your talk to have, I mean, there's a lot of talk about what to talk about and very little about organization. So, I mean, a lot of the problem that you discuss is the organization of a capitalist class sort of acting in its interests to sort of mobilize the state in its interests, and I think counter to the idea of a... Uh, you know, if a super version of the state, it's more of a redirection of the state towards, I mean, I think the state is probably functioning quite, quite well in certain ways, it just depends on what you're looking at. But in terms of what we should be doing, I mean, th there was virtually nothing about actually, about, about the organ, about social organization. So there, like, particularly, uh, the, you know, what, what, uh, you know, you, there's no mention of the problem of what social democracy, what social democratic parties, for example, have done in terms of buying into the logic that has been creating these these phenomena that you're talking about. There's been there's no talk of the role of you know union decline, for example, and that sort of as a as a sort of a concrete um, attack on a possible. Uh, social base that could actually do something to counter these forces that you're discussing. So, um, I, I, I'm, so basically, where does organization fit into all of this? Well, I agree. Yeah. I, I haven't talked about that. I've yeah. talked much more at the level of ideas. Um, and uh, that's because I know rather little about that range of issues that you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to come in, uh, in the yellow shirt? Uh, not in that particular thing. Uh, so you can probably finish that. I have a different question. I'm puzzled about something. Go ahead. I've finished. Oh, okay. <laughs> I disagree. Um, my understanding, uh, having come from a mathematics, computer science background, is that mathematics, pure theoretical mathematics, is amoral. Uh, but as soon as you start applying arithmetic and mathematics to a subject, it now is the tool of whatever it is the subject is about, and that then has value attached to it one way or another. However you're going at it, whatever the subject is, there are values involved in that. And one cannot say, well, we're just doing the math about this, so there's nothing moral about it. Economics, as I understand it, 
is applying mathematics to a specific body of questions and issues, and the outcomes of that mathematics with those issues has value and is by definition political, whether you want to recognize it or not. And I'm confounded by how an economist can say, oh, what I'm doing is amoral. You know, that they don't realize or can, cannot accept that the outcomes of the policies that they are promoting are somehow amoral and just simply one of the immutable attributes of the universe somehow. I, I, I don't understand how they can take this position. Well, because since the late 19th century, economists have very much wanted to present themselves as the social equivalent of physicists or natural scientists and to construct ways of avoiding, bypassing the um, issues that you've just been talking about. And one of the best ways of all, I mean, it's so, so neat, is the Pareto Principle totally implausible, but that's what economists have used in, in order to bypass it. If a change makes some people better off without making anybody worse off, then it is to be recommended. And some economists even took it further, which is that even if some people are made worse off, provided that those who gain could potentially, not actually, but potentially compensate the losers so that they would not lose, then it's still to be recommended. Um, and so uh, LSE got a lot of prominence uh, from having as its leading professor of economics and its director for many years, Lionel Robbins. Lionel Robbins was very emphatic about how um, economists could um, not talk about equity issues. They could talk about efficiency and be scientists like physicists and confidently recommend anything that would contribute to efficiency, as in something that met that Pareto criterion. And um, in that <coughs> way, a whole lot of kind of subterfuges were developed to allow economists to escape. And so it's only very recently, and by very recently, I mean literally in the last few years, <coughs> that there's been any serious um, <coughs> discussion at the level of the profession, for example, the American Economics Association, about getting any sort of ethical code or teaching of ethics in the way that doctors and engineers are taught <coughs> ethics. And to be a practicing engineer, you have to ascribe to a code of engineering practice. There's nothing like that for um, economists. Just last year, the American Economic Association took a very ba small baby step by way of re requiring disclosure of payments with, uh, from um, uh, funders of the, of the research or the, the publication. But that's about as far as it has gone. A friend of mine, George DiMartino, at, an economist at the University of Denver, but not in the economics department, in the School of International Studies, but he is an economist. He has been writing about um, ethics for economists, and he's editing now, right now, um, what is called... Um, the Handbook of Professional Economic Ethics. Um, you might think that was a very thin handbook, but actually it's got, it's, got, it's got a lot of papers in it, including one by me, which is called Economists' Ethics in the Build-Up to the Second Great Depression. Um, and in this I talk about the cases of Frederick Mishkin and <clears throat> in, in, in Iceland and so on as an example of how economists have managed to uh, get away with being, on the one <coughs> hand, the most influential social science by far in terms of affecting people's life chances, much more so than sociology, political science, anthropology, uh, psychology, by far the most influential, just as influential as doctors and engineers in terms of affecting people's life uh, prospects, and yet economists have no ethical standards. You talk to somebody about, a, an economist about ethics, they really don't know what you're talking about. There is no teaching of it whatsoever. So this 
tiny baby step by the American Economic Association is a little beginning, and then this work by George Di Martino and other contributors to his book is another little beginning. So um, this kind of gets back to the question that was asked earlier about am I being too pessimistic? I keep looking for even tiny little steps in the right direction. Um, yes, Gay. So, I, so I have two questions that are totally unrelated. Um, mm -hmm. One is about the ethics of the economist. I was sort of amused in your list of references at the end to see Paul Krugman, who we all love, mm -hmm. but he's an economist. In yeah. fact, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist. Mm -hmm. And so is George Stiglitz. And Jeffrey Sachs is kind of famous. Mm -hmm. what, I don't understand what happens among economists that certain economists who start raising ethical questions get written off within the discipline in some way, mm -hmm. even when they really think. Like, how does Krugman get as marginalized as he seems to be among mainstream? I, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. So, and then my other question is I don't understand what pre distribution is. So, could you say some more about what that is and why that's more politically viable? Well, pre distribution is just um, the distribution of incomes before any taxes and benefits are paid. So it's like looking so at wage it, equality it, rather yeah. than at post at Yeah, post-tax. Yeah, post yeah. And or salary. So minimum wage. Or, and capital gains as well. Or All those things before job. any tax is taken off and then before any benefits, welfare benefits or other kind of benefits are received. That's pre-distribution. But why would it be politically easier to talk about either reducing CEO salaries or raising salaries than ta I mean Because it's so easy to present that, as, um, and, as conservatives do, as um, the state thieving, stealing from the successful people, the people who have very high incomes, stealing their money and giving it to the losers. But why is it easier to say we're going to cap people's salary at the top level than to say... Because conservatives then present that as you, the state, or you, the left, are trying to handicap successful people. But you would, if you had a policy on pre-distribution, you'd also be handicapped. Right, that's what I'm not understanding why you'd be politically more successful. I'm a little confused. No, no, but I'm, uh, uh, what I'm saying is that um, all, all these, the, this array of policies that I showed, um, yeah. the exchange rate, um, corporate governance, trade union law, and so on and so on, um, they could be configured, reconfigured in certain kinds of ways to make them less, um, uh, generate, less generating of upwards uh, income distribution. That's quite different from, say, having an explicit cap, like saying that the ratio of the CEO salary to that of the median wage must not exceed a certain amount. That would be politically totally unviable. But there are ways of... Um, at least at the first step, exposing the way that institutions, rules, policies have the effect of pumping income <coughs> up to the top. That's the first step. On your uh, first point about um, what happens to economists, um, I'm going to quote from uh, one of the most uh, celebrated British uh, economists, I better not name him, um, but he's very well known as an academic, but also he's had high-level policy positions like in the Bank of England and also as an editor of the American Economic Review, the first non-American uh, based, uh, and, uh, yeah, the first non-American based uh, resident editor of the American Economic Review, and so he's had a key position in controlling ideas, the ideas that get accepted for the American Economic Review. Um, and he said in uh, 2011, so this is well after the crash, Keynes was a disaster. Skidelsky should be locked up, bracket, Skidelsky, Robert Skidelsky is Keynes's biographer and a prominent latter-day Keynesian economist arguing that the fundamental problem today, just like Krugman does, the fundamental problem today is a shortage of demand. Um, as, as indebted uh, households and firms contract their spending, and the state also contracts its spending. So he said, Keynes was a disaster. 
Skidelsky should be locked up. Krugman has lost all respect in the economics profession. Quote, unquote. And I, I was really taken aback by the vehemence with which he just dismissed um, Krugman. And um, he, he went on to say, um, show me one study, show me one study that shows a fiscal multiplier of more than one. The fiscal multiplier is the relationship between, uh, say, a 1% increase in public spending and uh, a percentage change in GDP. That's public spending to GDP. Show me a fiscal multiplier of more than one, uh, meaning that if there was an increase in public spending, the increase in GDP would be less than 1%, and so you shouldn't do it. Um, well, I said, uh, well, I said to him, well, show me a study that does find it less than one. And he mentioned the study by, what's her name? Um, Alessina at MIT is one of, Alberto Alessina is one of the two authors of this study. It was published in 2009. At the time when he told me this, I didn't know about this study. But what I now know was that there was lots of criticism of this study already by 2011 that my colleague had not somehow registered. And the criticism showed that the Alessina study, which found the fiscal multiplier less than one, was all of countries that were in robust expansion. In other words, um, my friend and colleague was applying um, a finding for countries in robust expansion to countries in deep recession. It's totally illegitimate, but he clung to that finding in order to justify his hardline kind of monetarism. Um, so the more I interact with real economists, the more I get the sense that this is a kind of uh, religion. It is, it is to be understood as um, a form of uh, re religious beliefs in which starts with the proposition that the market is kind of analogous to God and then all kinds of things follow from that, um, from that equation. I, I would love to see a serious study by a student of the sociology of religion, a study of economics <laughs> um, from this point of view. Are there other questions, suggestions? Yes. I just wanted to kind of throw out a comment and get your response to it. Um, the thing that was really terrifying to me about the table that you showed that we've probably all seen many times before about the share of one percent is that it only went to two thousand and six. Yeah. And unlike in the night in nineteen twenty nine, mm -hmm. we haven't seen a drop off since two thousand and six. We saw a drop off maybe slightly 2008, 2009, but it is continuing to go up now yeah, yeah. at an even faster rate than before. And what should we make of that? Be worried. <laughs> Be very worried. Um, you know, I, I don't, uh, of course, everybody wishes that there was a magic bullet. We could do something, uh, we could organize, um, <coughs> we could. Um, you know, get the left talking about the things I've been talking about. It's just not going to happen. There, there are very powerful lock-in mechanisms. I doubt if in, in the next 10 years, unless we have another <coughs> major crisis, and a crisis not out in East Asia, where there, and there may be a crisis uh, in East Asia if you look at what's happening in the housing markets of Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, um, but uh, not out in East Asia, but a crisis here, close to home, Unless there's such a crisis, uh, which really does shake the elite, um, and that, that I think is very unlikely, um, I just don't see any significant um, reduction in income concentration. So we will go on facing these costs um, for a long time. I, I don't see a kind of path out of it. But all I've been emphasizing is that the, the, the left, I'm talking particularly about the British left, but not only, um, has been really feeble in even drawing attention to this matter of income concentration. They're not even at first base because they're frightened. And they're frightened partly for the reason I mentioned at the very end, which is their dependence, including the Labour Party, their dependence on big donors for their campaign financing. 
And so they make all kinds of tactical decisions about what they talk about, what they don't talk about. And so their emphasis, for example, are on opportunities, not on outcomes, income outcomes, but on opportunities. That is very tactical because they know that um, the big donors don't worry when they hear the word improving opportunities. That's okay. And by the way, just let me mention, I told you what happened in the World Bank when this group wanted to write a World Development Report in 2006 on um, inequality in development. I told you what happened when this proposal went to the board. The board said, no, we can't write about um, inequality because that's political, but we can write about opportunities because that's apolitical. Well, guess who were the executive directors from which countries came the executive directors who most strongly made that argument? They were not the Americans, not the British. They were the executive directors from Russia and from China. They most strongly said the bank cannot talk about in, in inequality, can only talk about opportunities. And of course, yeah, and actually that reminds me of one other rather dramatic point. The official Chinese Gini coefficient is something like 0 0.48. But not long ago, a group of researchers at a particular Chinese university decided to make a real big effort to get top income earners into the sample so that the Gini coefficient would reflect more accurately the um, income distribution at the top. They came up with a conclusion that the more accurate figure for the Gini was about 0 0.6. 0 0.6. However, you can't then say uh, the, the official figure for India is, uh, is about 0 0.54 or 52, something like that. You can't say from this figure of 0 0.6 that therefore China is much more unequal to India because that same exercise has not been done in India. So many Indian wealthy are escaping from the Gini coefficient calculations. Um, is that generally true across countries? Yes, generally it is the case that the top income earners are um, very underrepresented in the Gini calculations, as in the case of the United States, which after all does have a very good, relatively speaking, a very good statistical base. It's only when Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Seiss at Berkeley uh, began to really try to bring in the top earners that this data on the top 1% became um, available. And other countries really haven't done it to anything like the same extent. So we're past our normal ending time. Was there one more question? Well, Mr. Quick, energy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just had a comment to make. I don't know how true this is, but yesterday or day before I was reading uh, that Switzerland is planning to hold a World Bank summit next year. Uh, I don't know if it's true. Well, I don't know about that, but I cannot believe it's um, 20 to 1. I mean, if you think of the poor German CEOs, they were 90 to 1. Uh, the Americans, what was it, over 300 to 1. So I don't believe for a minute that Switzerland has a, has a cap on anything like that. And, and of course, of all the people in the world, the Swiss are the best at putting their money into tax havens and invisible bank accounts. So um, on the face of it, I wouldn't place much um, store on that piece of news. Thanks very much. Thank you.